Welcome to the next part of the stone modeling tutorial. I'm Sascha Henrichs. The first part covered stone modeling with displacements and the second part is about UV mapping and painting of the object. I'll show two approaches for this. The first mapping method is the fast way and it's called blended box mapping. It's good when you have to map plenty of stones. We take the easy route for this by using a blended box mapping script from Neil Blevins, but more on this later. And the second method will cover a non-destructive UV unwrap workflow that leaves our modifier stack intact. And later on we'll paint our stone in Mudbox 2010. So, here it goes. Take your stone from the first part and apply a texture to it. There is already a grey material assigned, which we open in the editor and click on the small grey rectangle next to the diffuse entry. The diffuse channel of a material is the color giving channel. In this case I chose a tileable stone texture. There. And this one is very neutral and can be used as a base for many stone structures. Once applied, you see that our stone already has a mapping. That's because it's made out of a box object, which had UVs already applied. This texture doesn't have any bigger features in it, so it looks fine so far. But as soon as you put a texture on it that has plenty of color and brightness contrasts in it, like in the next example here, you will also bump into recognizable seams in the top and bottom of this box mapping. There you see it. So, to map the stone without seams, while using texture maps, we have two basic options. The first one comes with a method Neil Blevins explained on his site neilblevins.com. It's called blended box mapping and it's basically planar mapping projected from all axes in separate mapping channels and then blended with falloff maps. How it works in detail can be reviewed in his article about blended box mapping that you can find in his education area on his site. However, it's a bit complex and Neil did us uh, the favor to wrap this technique into a single easy to use Mac script like he did with plenty of techniques that you all find in his valuable script package named Soulburn Scripts. So what you do is download this package, install it and use the blended box map maker script right on the top of our modifier stack. When you do this, the user interface opens and I used a size value of 600 and a map tile amount of 2.5. Then put your texture into the first map slot of the map section and click the do button. Make sure you chose an unused map slot in the material editor before, because a new map will be generated in the selected slot. Then choose the stone material again and drag and drop the new created map as an instance into the diffuse slot of your stone material. So now you have a seamless map on your stone. However, this technique only works at render time and not in the viewport. See it here and you can still recognize some minor stretches, but you won't bump into seams anymore. This map also can be baked to a low poly object as a base texture without seams. So that's the whole story about the first mapping technique. It's very fast and can easily be applied to a huge load of objects. The drawback is its lack of detail when, it's come to, uh, uh, when it comes to lighten up edges or putting some ambient occlusion into the texture. If we need this, we have to set up a unique mapping with, uh, with uh, the UV unwrap modifier, which is the second technique we will discuss in this tutorial. So when we head for unwrapping this, we bump into the problem of a very high poly count. Unwrapping these poly counts means first waiting and then crashing. So we are forced to reduce the poly count for a while and then map the object. So switch to the Turbo Smooth modifier and use only two iterations there. Then put your UV unwrap modifier on the top of your stack because all deformations we apply to the stone should be represented in the mapping. That's why we put it on top of the stack. So, before I start, I lower the tile brightness and the UV editor's preferences, for that I can better see the UV edges. 
Then I select all current UVs and drag them away from the center mapping space. Then scroll down on the right side in the modifier settings and click on point to point seams. You should work in polygon sub-object mode for this. I will now set so-called pelt seams in the 3D space by clicking on the starting vertex and then the target vertex. 3ds Max will then try to connect these two points with a blue line. These blue lines will be the borders of our UV chunks or UV islands. You can make only a few of them or even uh, just two UV islands by setting a single seam surrounding the stone, but I choose to make some more so that our UV space can be used more efficiently and the UV chunks are not that stretched in the end. Also try to avoid spanning a UV chunk over any hard angles to avoid later UV relaxing problems. That's because I try to place the seams right on the top of the corners of our stone. The ultimate goal will be to paint the stone in mud box with this mapping and use one 4069 square pixel texture for the diffuse channel. You could also try an automatic mapping by clicking on the menu bar of the UV editor and then on mapping and then flatten mapping. This tool will give you a mapping in seconds, but besides some good shaped UV chunks you might get plenty of very small islands or even single polys in the mapping and that's not very comfortable to work with, especially when you want to tweak your later texture in Photoshop. So in this case I might go a bit frenzy with mapping seams and it's not really necessary to ma make that much. But then again it's all not very crucial. The point is to get a mapping that is simple to read, easy to manipulate and all relaxed. So when you are ready with the seams we should be still in polygon sub-object mode. Then you can most easily just click into the existing UVs inside the UV space and press the button Expand Face Selection to Seams. Then press Quick Planar Map in the Map Parameter section and a closed UV chunk will appear in the center of the, map of the mapping space. Then click again in the into the UV pile and then on Quick this Planar Map again. until all Repeat. polys are mapped. Then you have a new pile of UVs in the center of the UV space and to align them we use the automatic packing which we find in the tools menu in the top. You just have to open the dialog and confirm. Done this we have all our UV chunks separated inside the space. Now we need to relax them since they are still stretched by the quick planar mapping method. For this select all UV chunks and open the relax tool inside the tools menu. Set the, the rollout to relax by face angles and set the amount to 1. Then press start relax and wait some seconds. Anyway, when you see a chunk rotating endlessly or crumpling somehow, select this chunk, switch the rollout to relax by edge angles and start relax again. It should unfold now. Then use relax by face angles on it once more and be fine. When still some chunks are rotating but are relaxed correctly, then never mind and press stop relax. The mapping seams are spent over a difficult to relax angle in this case. And if you want to fix it absolutely, you'd have to uh, set more seams there. After the relax procedure, use the pack UVs tool again. The tool will do its best to distribute the chunks, but in the end you will have to place the chunks on your own to get the most out of your mapping. But you have to be careful to not scale single UV chunks to better fit them inside, otherwise you would destroy the, si the size ratio, leading to some chunks getting more pixels and then having a better resolution than other chunks. The space a pixel takes on a 3D surface is called its texel size. All UV chunks should get the same texel ratio than the others. Also when placing the chunks make sure they got some empty space to all sides since mud box can be picky when painting diffuse textures where the edge bleeding gets in contact to the UV space borders. 
edge bleeding pixels are interpolated texture pixels right at the borders of UV chunks. They are to minimize seam artifacts at the UV borders, especially when using MIP mapping. Now comes the tricky part. Because since we want all our displacement details back, we need more iterations again. But when a mapping is applied, you cannot simply rise the turbo smooth iterations again. This will completely reset your mapping, since the mapping vertices are referenced to their referring 3D vertices. And when the 3D vertex count rise, it will also destroy the vertex index order. And the mapping vertices don't know anymore to which 3D vertex they belong. And you also cannot undo this. This will make things even worse. The mapping will explode and you will have to reload the file. Then again, placing a new Turbo Smooth modifier above your UV mapping is also no choice, since the poly count have to be existent before the displacement modifiers try to deform our object. So we need a workaround. First, we drag and drop the UV unwrap modifier right under the first displacement modifier. Then add another Turbo Smooth above the UV unwrap modifier and add the missing, mi uh, the missing iterations with it. In fact, we need four more iterations, but for the painting part we stay with three, just to preserve some performance inside Modbox. You can also check if the mapping is still there by adding a new unwrap modifier on top of the stack and just open the UV editor. There. When everything is ok, kill the top unwrap modifier again and head for an export of the stone object. Use the OBJ format and set the, the mudbox preset in the export dialog. Uh, then switch over to mudbox and import the object. Before I paint the stone, I right-click it and edit the material. The default material is too shiny and I reduce both specular values there. Oh, that's better. Then switch over to paint mode and create a new layer with a 4096 resolution in it. Then open the Paint Tools tab in the lower left and activate the projection brush. Now select a texture to project onto the stone. For this open the image browser in the upper left and navigate to a tile texture of your choice. Select it and use the button set a stencil above the preview window. When you now switch to the 3D view again you should see your stencil blended over the 3D canvas. In the stencil options I turn on use tiles for that the stencil becomes infinite and I lower the visibility. And now we are ready to paint. In this case I have set some very hard fall off values for my brush which I try to get rid of. In the end it's a mix between the fall off and the brush strength that makes this hard edge. While painting you will see that painting around corners will give you stretched pixels. To avoid this you can turn the viewport camera for that's facing directly to the corner and then just paint right onto it. When the corner is too hard you have to tilt the camera a bit and then paint each side of the corner. Paint the stone till it's completely wrapped by the texture and then rotate around the object and overpaint any remaining stretches. When you're done, create a new layer and name it Lights. This new layer will contain some lighter edges that are painted on the convex corners of our object. This will give some detail to our geometry and, um, uh, not geometry, to our texture and the object will be better to read. Since Modbox 2010 does not contain blending modes for layers and I'm too lazy to, bl to blend uh, in Photoshop afterwards, I created a very light version of the same stone texture I used for the base layer. 
I choose this texture inside the image browser and set its visibility to zero since I have to uh, make very short strokes now and then use the projection brush again to paint the lights onto the convex parts. Anyway, you should use a very thin brush for this since this adds more detail. When I'm through with that, I make a new layer and name it Darks. And for this layer, I use a dark version of the same texture again and paint it mostly on the concave parts of my stone. This brush can be white and have a soft fall off since the shadows uh, should not add detail but depth. Yes, and so on. You could always improve this texture by adding even more details like mosses or lichens, but in this case this should be enough. Now when you are ready and don't want to blend these layers afterwards in Photoshop, then you have to hide the top layer and merge the, remaining, uh, the two remaining visible. Then unhide the top layer and merge again. Then you do a right click on the remaining layer and export it. If you want you could now do some color correction or detail work inside Photoshop but if you're fine with it then uh, switch to 3ds Max again, load the diffuse map into the diffuse channel of a material and uh, assign it to the stone. Then turn on the last iteration of the TurboSmooth modifier again and enjoy your high detail, unique mapped and completely seam-free procedural stone. So, and that was the second part of the procedural stone tutorial. I hope you could learn something and uh, see you next time. The next part will cover how to make this stone a uh, game-ready asset. So be sure to check back as sashahenrys.blogspot.com. Bye!